What's up, guys? It's me, your boy, Nolan Burr Raymond. And today, I'm here with my little friend, Dominic Godson, and we're going to be talking about a movie that I like to call Spider-Man 3. I actually, everybody likes to call that movie because that's the title of the film. It's actually the third movie in the series, and chronologically, that means it's the third one that takes place in the timeline. And this movie's main character is Spider-Man. Spider-Man 3 is the conclusion to the original Spider-Man trilogy. Directed by Sam Raimi, starring Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man 3 brings three of Spider-Man's most iconic villains to the forefront. Namely, New Goblin, played by James Franco, Sandman, played by Thomas Hayden Church, and Venom, played by Topher Grace. Rated at PG-13, this movie is a fun romp for teenagers. I believe that the film was merely a fan service to fans of the Spidey comics. On top of cramming a whole three villains into one movie, we also have a whole new Peter Parker, our protagonist, that gets muddled throughout the film. We're introduced to the alien creature, only known as Symbiote, which, explained by Dr. Kurt Connors, attaches itself to a host and takes control. Because of this, we get a whole new version of Peter Parker we've never seen before and frankly, never asked for! Sure, nobody asked for emo Peter Parker, but at the same time, this is one of the very few highlights of the film. Not because of how intriguing the plot point is, but because of how ridiculous all of Peter Parker's scenes are after his personality changes and requires outrageous acting! Not a single scene, emo Parker can be taken seriously. It feels very out of place for the series, otherwise nature, dramatic nature of the film. Despite this, this is one of the only reasons I watch this film, just because it's so funny, because it's just so freaking stupid, bro. It's so stupid that the studio that made that scene made fun of it in a much better Spider-Man movie more than a decade later! We don't really talk about this. As strange as this may be, the final fight scene is still awesome enough to get my spidey senses tingling. Without spoiling too much, Venom is an absolute badass in this final scene. Speaking of Venom, it really sucks that he's only in this film for a whole 45 minutes. He was the whole reason I was excited to watch this movie as a seven-year-old in theaters, because it was of Venom. First off, before I talk about Spider-Man, did you know that spicy nuggets come back to Wendy's? Okay, Venom by far could have been the coolest aspect of the movie, and I was, I was just loving when I watched the movie as a young kid. But upon rewatching the film, I've come to realize that Eddie Brock is horribly miscast. Spite Topher Grace's talents, that on top of his short screen time is the biggest disappointment of the film. I would have preferred a film that was exclusively the Venom symbiote arc, so I'm coming for you, Sam Raimi. The story starts out with Harry Osborn slash New Goblin seeking vengeance against Spider-Man, as known as his best friend Peter Parker. Flint Marco slash Sandman slowly reveals that it was he who was exactly responsible for Uncle Ben's untimely demise. Eddie Brock slash Venom is introduced as what most comic book fans would think of as Peter. He's quippy, tries too hard to be funny, and is probably a better photographer than Peter, but don't tell him that. It's hard to pick out one major plot point in this movie, but I'd say the most memorable aspect of this film for most people would have to be the symbiote, which creates the black Spider-Man suit and Venom. Unfortunately, however, the film is far too unfocused and it's not as pronounced as it should be. James Franco, playing as Peter's best friend Harry, has some of the best acting in the entire trilogy. In this movie, parallel to Peter, Harry infects himself with what we'll call the Green Goblin Serum and becomes a mysterious, at sometimes crazy villain. He secretly backstabs Peter, resulting in one of the best hand-to-hand -hand confrontational fights in cinematic superhero history. It packs serious emotion, and Harry walks out with a blown-up face. This is certainly a treat for fans of the first two films, because despite it only being in the first 
felt, it seems to me, that Green Goblin is the true enemy of Spider-Man, just like in the comic books. It's a great conclusion to the Goblin aspect of the Sam Raimi trilogy, although it would have been nice to see even more if they had actually made a fourth film like they originally had intended. Spider-Man is so cool, and this movie is so bad that I went ahead and got a wallet that has Spider-Man on it. That doesn't even have the black suit because the original Spider-Man is way better, and you can fight me on that. I don't have a Spider-Man wallet, but I got a Warren County Library card. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you gotta have your morph suit, man. Bouncing off of that, there was actually a spin-off animated series on MTV called Spider-Man, the new animated series. It took place after the events of the first movie, and it was, uh, it only had one season, and was an absolute treat, uh, but that's a whole different story. Cartoons. Speaking of animated series, an aspect that I really thought was cool about this film is that it plays homage to the Spider-Man animated series from the 90s through the use of cinematography in a scene where <laughs> Spider-Man is looking at the reflection of his new suit in the window of a skyscraper. One saving grace of this movie is the amazing sound! Spidey's thwips of his webs sound better than ever before. Also, one of the best superhero series yes. the girls... <laughs> Also, one of the best Superhero Saves the Girl scenes came from this very movie. The sound during the scene is pristine and everyone keeps on their toes. I, <laughs> I remember my heart dropping to my stomach when I saw this as a kid. soundtrack sounded freaking fire as well, but what can you expect if Danny Elfman is involved? For this movie, Elfman was wary composing the music because of his experience composing for the first two films, because he thought Sam Raimi was a total bitch. But for the third installment, he teamed up with Christopher Young, who's actually old, so his name doesn't even make any freaking sense, to produce probably the best of the three film soundtracks due to the absolute range that was required from multiple different villains being present. So let's talk photography. In terms of photography, there's a scene where Spidey's about to fight the final villains. As he swings in, there's a five to 10 second cut of him on a building with an American flag behind it because nothing screams patriotism than a guy wearing red and blue spandex about to kick some ass. All in all, there's plenty wrong with this film, which is disappointing because if it would have been anywhere near the same caliber of the first two films, then it would have been a very enjoyable movie. I think there were just too many good ideas which could not all be fleshed out in a single feature length film. It would have been so much better if it had focused primarily on the conflict between Spider-Man and the New Goblin. For this and many other reasons, I unfortunately am going to have to give this film 2.5 I swear on my father's grave, Spider-Man will pay. Out of five. Oh shit. Dude. There we go. There we go. This. Okay. <laughs> For its direct desire to be a fan service, haha, uh -huh. and for cramming way too many villains into one film, but for its sound, and for James Franco's acting, I'm gonna go a step up and give this three, how do you like that, Spidey, out of five. Ooh.